Last video, we explored the various sizes of infinity, known in the business as cardinality, and I tried to demonstrate its usefulness by solving a problem involving having you navigate an island peppered with infinitely many mines packed infinitely densely. And while I hope that gave you at least a small sense of how cardinality can be useful, I feel that some might have been turned off, because it was still a pretty contrived and theoretical example. I mean, how many of us are really going to find ourselves navigating an infinitely dense minefield? And you know what? Fine. Guilty as charged. Honestly, if you're looking for a day-to-day, real-life situation where cardinality would be directly useful, there probably isn't one. But that being said, cardinality is still an important concept in math. So if you're still with me, I'd like to share one more example of why cardinality matters. It's admittedly another theoretical example, but this one has roots in some serious mathematics, functional analysis and measure theory, and the study of infinite dimensional spaces, branches of math that really are quite important. Hopefully this video can shed a little bit of light on what these theories are about, what they try to do, and how cardinality can limit what is possible within them. One of the central ideas of functional analysis is finding a way to treat seemingly non-vectory things as vectors, things like sequences and functions. It's a tricky business to do correctly, but the benefit is being able to apply a lot of the same concepts for vectors to things like functions. For example, you can view an infinite sequence of real numbers as a vector with infinitely many components, each term in the sequence being a component. Similarly, you can also view a function that takes real number inputs and outputs as a vector with infinitely many components, each component coming from plugging in a different real number to the function, or in other words, the y-coordinate of every xy pair in the function's graph. The difference here is that since the real numbers are uncountable, a function defined over the real numbers has uncountably many possible inputs, meaning it has uncountably many components when viewed as a vector, whereas an infinite sequence only has countably infinitely many components. Now, if you watched my video on the Riemann series theorem, you might remember that I briefly mentioned a way to extend the notion of the dot product from finite dimensional vectors to infinite sequences of real numbers. And it turned out the basic idea was pretty simple. You just turn the finite sum into an infinite sum. Though we did have to restrict ourselves to a special subset of sequences to ensure that the infinite sum would converge and be stable under rearrangement. But nevertheless, the basic idea was pretty simple. So maybe using the same idea, we can extend this dot product on sequences, which only contain countably many components, to real-valued functions, which have uncountably many components turning a sum of countably many terms into a kind of sum with uncountably many terms, just possibly with some sort of additional restriction to make sure the sum behaves nicely. Well, what do you think? What will happen if we move from a countably infinite sum to an uncountable sum? Will things work out mostly the same as before? What additional constraints need to be in place to ensure an uncountable sum converges? And how exactly do you even add up uncountably many terms anyway? Is that even possible? Let's begin by simplifying things a bit by only considering an uncountable sum of positive terms, however that's supposed to work. This would correspond to trying to add up all the outputs of a function whose graph is always above the x-axis. What constraints do we need to impose on our function to ensure this uncountable sum of its outputs results in a finite number? Well, with our old countably infinite series, we know of at least one basic constraint. The terms have to shrink at least somewhat quickly in order to converge to a finite sum. We can't have too many big terms, otherwise the series will diverge. But it's not enough that the terms just shrink toward zero. They also have to shrink fast enough. The classic example to illustrate this is the harmonic series, one plus a half plus a third plus a fourth and so on, where the individual terms of the series are shrinking and approaching zero, but the sum of the series is nevertheless still infinite, because the individual terms are approaching zero too slowly. So the basic takeaway from our old friends, the countably infinite series, is that to converge to a finite total, you can't be adding up too many big terms. 
they have to be shrinking to zero, and doing so at some kind of minimum speed. So when the jump from a countable to an uncountable number of terms, it seems reasonable that we would similarly need to avoid having too many big terms. They would have to shrink quickly, and probably much faster than they do for countably infinite sums, since uncountable infinity is so much bigger than countable infinity. But how much faster do they need to shrink? Of course, we still haven't even defined what adding up uncountably many numbers means, or even if it's possible. But actually, let's not worry about that for now. However an uncountable sum is supposed to work, we do expect addition to behave in certain ways. So for now, let's state a basic property that any reasonable definition of an uncountable sum, or really any sum, of positive numbers should satisfy. Adding a subset of terms results in a smaller sum. Makes sense, right? If I'm looking at adding up the numbers 1 through 10, and I instead throw away some of the terms and look only at the sum from, say, 1 through 5, I'll end up with a smaller total. This property carries over to countably infinite sums, too. If I throw away terms from an infinite series of positive terms, the resulting sum, if it was finite, becomes smaller. So it seems pretty reasonable to require uncountable sums, however they work, to obey the same principle. Let's call it the subset principle. Now, I know I'm making a big deal about what probably seems like a super basic idea, but as you'll see, the subset principle will actually be pivotal in discovering what an uncountable sum with a finite total would have to look like. To see what I mean, let's say we have an uncountable collection of positive numbers that we're trying to add up somehow, perhaps illustrated with a graph of a function like this one. And let's say we want to figure out what conditions are required to make the total sum be finite. Like we noted earlier, remember that for an infinite sum to have any hope of being finite, we need to make sure there aren't too many big terms. But what exactly do we mean by big here? Well, uh, I don't know. But just to have something to start with, how about we say any number greater than 1 is big? If we want our uncountable sum to have a finite total, how many numbers bigger than 1 can we afford? Well, only finitely many, right? Think about it. If we add up infinitely many numbers that are bigger than 1, the sum will have to be infinite. And if we already reached infinity just by adding up the subset of numbers that are bigger than 1, then continuing to add any of the other terms that are smaller than 1 isn't going to bring it back down to being finite. That's the subset principle. So the takeaway here is we can only have a finite number of terms that are bigger than 1. But can you see where this is going? There's nothing special here about the number 1. We could have said the same thing for any number, like 1 half, or 1 third, or 1 1 thousandth. If you add up infinitely many numbers that all have some minimum size, even a really tiny minimum size as long as it's not zero, the resulting sum will diverge to infinity. This means that our uncountable sum can only contain a finite number of terms greater than any given positive number a. Of course, there will be more terms the smaller a is, but the point is that the number of terms greater than any given positive lower bound has always got to be finite. Alright, but now think about what this means for how many non-zero terms there could possibly be in our uncountable sum. If there can only be a finite number of terms bigger than 1, and likewise only a finite number of terms bigger than, say, 1 half, then there can only be a finite number of terms that are between 1 and 1 half. Likewise, since there can only be a finite number of terms that are bigger than one-third, there can only be a finite number of terms between one-half and one-third. And similarly, only a finite number of terms between one-third and one-fourth, and so on. In fact, there can only be a finite number of terms between any two fractions 1 over n and 1 over n plus 1. But here's the punchline. These little fraction segments cover all the positive numbers less than 1. Any positive number is either bigger than 1, equal to 1 of the 1 over n fractions, or is between 2 of them. But how many of these little fraction segments are there? Well, there's got to be only countably infinitely many, right? Because we can uniquely label each segment based on the denominator of its lower bound, 
thus giving a one-to-one -one association between fraction segments and the natural numbers. So there are only countably infinitely many fraction segments. And within each segment, there can only be finitely many terms. But then the union of all the terms must be countably infinite as well, because you can count up all the terms in one segment before moving on to the next. So there can only be a countably infinite number of terms that are non-zero. What this means is that no matter how we define what an uncountable sum is, if it obeys the subset principle, it can only have at most countably infinitely many non-zero terms to have any hope of having a finite total. Which is basically to say that uncountable sums with a finite total are impossible, because the only ones that there could be are really just countably infinite sums in disguise, hiding among an uncountable sea of zeros. This might feel like a disappointing result, because almost all real-valued functions that are interesting at all contain uncountably many non-zero outputs. So it means we won't be able to extend the dot product to functions in the same way we did for sequences. But in math, just like in science, negative results can be useful too. It just means we'll have to find some more fundamentally different way to define a dot product for functions. The standard solution is instead of taking a sum over all the possible outputs of the function, you instead take an integral. So just like how a dot product over vectors and sequences can be written as a sigma sum of products over all the terms, a dot product over real valued functions can be written as the integral of the product of two functions over the input space. And it turns out, this definition behaves just like we'd want a dot product to behave. Or at least it will if we impose some basic restrictions on the behavior of the functions. Now, some of you might have guessed much earlier on that an integral would show up here, as integrals may seem like the obvious continuous analog of a sigma sum. But that's not really the point I wanted to make here. What we've seen is that not only is an integral a fairly natural-seeming way to extend a dot product to functions, but it's kind of necessary. We've just shown that there's no way to get a traditional infinite sum to work for functions with uncountably many non-zero outputs. You'll always get an infinite total. So turning to integrals is not only natural, but kind of required to extend dot products to functions. And I think that's pretty cool. And what made the difference is the differing cardinalities of the integers versus the real numbers. <laughs>